Hi guys. I'd like to go over something today that's come up a few times in my teaching with students and tutorials and going over scenarios. Uh, and it's something I've always had in my mind a little bit, but it's not something I've ever really properly uh, explained in any format before. So this is a bit of a Mark Kolbeck original. You won't find anyone else referring to this. So if you want to read deeper about it, um, you can't because <laughs> I just made it up. Uh, but it's something I call critical complaints and it's a part of the secondary survey that we teach, the Paramedic International Primary and Secondary Survey. So what I'd like to present here is a quick overview of this sort of novel concept of critical complaints and put it into the context of the primary and secondary survey that we published a paper on back in 2018. You can see it down there. It's in the Irish Journal of Paramedicine and it's a I think it's a really helpful paper and it's an approach that we use uh, where I teach with all of our students. So they've all learned how to do this primary and secondary survey. So I'll very quickly touch on the primary survey, but I'll focus more on the secondary survey and talking about where the concept of these critical complaints comes into the secondary survey and why it's important. And then I'm going to demonstrate how we use these concepts to answer the question, how sick is your patient? So first of all, the primary survey, we use the, the initialism, safety first, get A, B, C, D, E's. And it leads through there on the screen, you can see how we do, how we use that uh, initialism for uh, an approach, a primary approach to our patients. This can take, you know, in cardiac arrest, you don't really get past the primary survey. Uh, in other calls, you can walk in and say, how you doing? They say, fine. It's like, well, pretty good. Pretty much done the primary survey. So I'm not going to belabor the primary survey. If you want to find out more, you can read the article or go to paramedicine.com. Sonia and I discussed this in a podcast that goes about an hour. So we've already done it in fair detail. In the secondary survey, the way we remember the secondary survey is to remember, I see I had vitals assessed and treated. And the C there is for chief complaint. So typically when we get into the secondary survey, we'll have already identified ourselves in the primary survey. And then we ask the patient, what's your name? And they might say, Fred. Hi, Fred. Then we'll go on to the chief complaint and we'll ask what seems to be the problem today. And Fred will present in his own words what the problem is for him today. And he might say, my hand is really sore. I woke up, it's aching. And I just, I think I better get it checked. It's a fairly sort of nondescript chief complaint. When Fred gives us the chief complaint in his words, the next thing we do is we ask about the five critical complaints. And again, this is something I've made up, but it's a really, really useful approach to the patient. So let's go through those five critical complaints. Fred says, my hand is sore. I say to Fred, okay, thanks for letting me know. Is that the only problem or is that the primary problem that you've called us for today? Yeah, my hand, it's just really sore. I say, all right, I've heard that. Before I, before I ask you any more about your hand, I want to ask you about a few other things just to make sure there's no other problems. And Fred might say, go ahead. Or he might say, yeah, yeah, there's nothing else. And I'll say, you know, please indulge me. It's just I want to be thorough to make sure I've got an understanding of what's going on. He says, okay. So the five critical complaints that I want to focus on are listed here. And basically this came about because, you know, in my experience as a paramedic, the question that we're often asking is, uh, is there anything that's going to kill my patient really quick? Anything that I need to worry about between here and the hospital, however far away the hospital is, that is dangerous that I might need to attend to? What's going to kill or really hurt this patient? And the answer is, if you've got a problem with your brain or with your heart or with your lungs, or if you go into shock or you've got an overwhelming infectious disease, those are the things that are going to kill you quick. So I want to know about those and make sure that there aren't any of those going on. So when Fred says, yeah, my wrist really hurts, if I just go on and say, just your wrist? Yeah. Ever had it before? No. You want to go to the hospital? Yeah. All right. Can you walk? Sure. Well, let's go to the hospital. Then you go to the hospital, the triage nurse says, what's the problem? And says Fred, Fred says, I've got a real pain in my wrist and, you know, a bit in my arm. And the triage nurse says, does it radiate in your chest at all? Oh yeah, I got this heavy pressure on my chest. Oops, <laughs> you've just missed something really, really critical. So you need to ask about those things to make sure that you've got a really good understanding of what the actual chief complaint is in your patient. So brain, heart, lungs, perfusion, and infectious diseases. 
when the patient presents their chief complaint to me, I go through and I make sure that there aren't any of those critical complaints present. So let's talk about how we go through them. The first is I'm going to ask them what their chief complaint is. If they don't mention any of the chief complaints, I'm going to ask about each of those five ones specifically. And if they mention one of the critical complaints, I'm going to make sure I ask about the other four. If they mention a few of them, I'm going to ask about the remaining ones. I'm specifically going to ask about each of those five critical complaints on every patient that I meet to make sure that there isn't some hidden problem that I'm unaware of that I really should be aware of as a competent thorough clinician. So let's go through the first one. The first thing I'm, Fred says, yeah, my wrist hurts. I say, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Is that okay? Sure. First of all, are you feeling uh, dizzy or lightheaded? Does it seem like the spins rooming, the room is spinning, the spins rooming around, the room's spinning around. He says, no, nothing like that. Do you have a headache at all? Any sort of soreness in your head? No, nothing. And as I ask them those questions. I'll also be taking a look in the italicized text below. Are they confused? Do they have memory loss? Do they have very sort of obvious neurological deficits as they're speaking to you? Are they not moving one side of their body? Stuff like that. And it's just a quick set of questions. Dizzy, lightheaded? Is the room spinning? No. Headache? No, nothing like that. Okay. Brain seems to be okay. Superficially, at a first pass, I'm not worried about the brain. I can tick off. Brain seems okay. Next question is heart. Do you have any pain or discomfort, any pressure uh, or anything else like that in your chest? No, nope, nothing like that. How about in your belly, your neck, your arms, your back? No, that's, that's fine. Okay, heart seems to be okay. Again, very superficial, but I'm just asking quickly to make sure I don't need to investigate further in that area. When he says, no, it's all fine, good enough for now. How about your breathing? Are you breathing okay? Any trouble breathing? Is it tough to catch your breath? No. Can you take a deep breath like this? Hold it and then let it out. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, tick. His lungs are fine. I can move on to the next one. And the next one is perfusion. Specifically, I'm looking for shock. And there's really only one question that I ask here usually. And that question is, do you remember the last time you peed or urinated or whatever term you want to use? And generally... If it's been more than about six to eight hours since they last peed, I, I start to get a little bit concerned. So when I'm worried about perfusion, I, I tend to think of perfusion as kidneys, and that's why that's the organ I associate with perfusion. And that's why I ask about the last time they peed. But what I'm looking for more is actually a finding of do they have a radio pulse? And the reason I wonder about that as my quick check is... Uh, as one of my mentors said to me when I was learning initially to be a paramedic, if they've got a pulse going to their wrist, then that means their pulse is certainly going to their brain, their heart, their lungs, their kidneys. And those are the vital organs that we want to make sure are being appropriately perfused. So if they've got a good strong radio pulse and they've peed within the last six to eight hours, I'm not so worried about them being in shock. Later, I can find out about their BP. If I don't feel a radio pulse, I'm going to try to get a BP pretty quick at least as a baseline. I know it's bad, but I want to know what it is as a baseline. And then are they shocky? Do they look pale and sweaty? And are they confused? And confusion is a bit of a, a Venn diagram sort of finding, because if you've got problems with your heart, or if you've got problems with your lungs, or if you've got problems with your brains, that brain, we only have one, then they all sort of overlap onto levels of awareness. So confusion is one of the ones we ask that applies to a lot, but it also, one of the things that applies to is perfusion. So confusion, think perfusion. And the last one is infection. And my first sort of catch-all question is, have you been sick lately? Uh, and the, no, not really. Okay, have you had a cough, cold, flu, fever, muscle aches, shivers, anything like that? No. Are you on Panadol or Tylenol, as we'd say in North America? No. All right, I'm going to take their temperature anyway. Any nausea, vomiting, diarrhea? Nope, nothing like that. Then I think about what are the uh, areas that people usually get infections in. And the biggest ones are sort of top to bottom is they get an ear infection, um, they get a lung infection, they get a urinary tract infection, kidneys down. So what I'll often do is I'll just tap gently on their head and say, is that sore? Have your ears been sore? No. Have you been coughing up anything, a productive cough? Nope, nothing like that. No difficulty breathing, which I've already asked about. Nope. 
Okay, um, then I go onto their back and where their kidneys are, I'll just give a gentle thump and I'll say, if I thump on your back like that, does that hurt? If they have a kidney infection, it's really going to hurt. Uh, if you can thump on their back, just, you know, pound them, just sort of like that. Um, and it does hurt, then I start to think kidney infection. And I ask, does it hurt when you pee? Have you had any burning sensation? No, nope, nothing like that. Fred says, just my wrist. Okay. I'm going to take their temperature. If they've got an elevated temperature, obviously I start to think about infection. I ask them if they've traveled or been exposed to anybody else who might be sick. Um, do they have knuckle rigidity? And knuckle rigidity, if you haven't done neuro yet, is we have these layers covering our brain and our spine called the meningeal layers or the meninges. And if they're inflamed, if there's an infection and they're inflamed, and we ask people to uh, touch their chin to their chest, keeping their mouth closed, which you may remember your doctor doing regularly when they do a physical exam. Just touch your chin to your chest with your mouth closed. If the meninges are inflamed, as we do this, it stretches the meninges and it really hurts. So we have this um, sort of a reflex as people to go, ow, ow, ow. And we get this cogwheel rigidity as we tilt our head forward. And if you see the patient going, oh, oh, we ask, is that sore? Yes, we start to think about meningism, that they might have infections there. And then we just do a quick feel underneath their throat. Again, as your doctor's probably done to you a hundred times, just having a feeling we're feeling for inflamed lymph nodes. And if they say, no, that's all fine, great. Then I'm happy. I've gone through my five critical complaints. None of them are present. I can get back to Fred's chief complaint of his sore wrist or whatever chief complaint your patient is presenting with. So the question comes up when I'm discussing with uh, students, not patients, when I discuss this with students is, well, what happens if they've got a bunch of critical complaints? So first of all, that's bad. Having problems with your brain and your heart and your lungs is uh, not a healthy patient. So we worry about those patients. But usually when we hear more than one critical complaint, we try to figure out which is the one that started it. What's the first domino? So if someone says, for example, to me, I woke up and I was having chest pain and after about you know 20 minutes of chest pain, it started to get difficult to breathe and then maybe about 10 minutes later, I started getting dizzy and I thought, you know, I really have to call for paramedics now. Well, I start with the heart because that's the one that started first. And I'm thinking, okay, so... Maybe this is acute coronary syndrome, ACS. So they've got decreased cardiac output. The decreased cardiac output means they're getting globally hypoxemic and the brain getting hypoxemic has started to lead, that gives the shortness of breath. And then the brain getting hypoxemic is leading to the altered mental status. So I'm gonna start initially going down my acute coronary syndrome pathway and asking about you know the RSVP3 heart exam, which we'll talk about in a different um, video lecture at I don't know what to call these, um, a different talk, fireside chat. We'll talk about the RSVP3 heart exam. But for now, if I think the first domino is cardiac, I'm going to do a focused assessment on the cardiovascular system. On the other hand, they might say to you, oh, I'm a really bad asthmatic and I've run out of Ventolin and I'm having trouble catching my breath. It's been about two or three hours, but now I'm starting to get you know, my, my chest is starting to hurt. And I think, okay, well, respiratory came first. It's been well established for several hours. Now they're starting to get chest pain. Well, maybe they're getting myocardial hypoxia and that's why their chest is starting to hurt. Or maybe they start to say, I'm starting to get dizzy and tired. And I think, okay, that could be that they're getting um, uh, CO2 retention. They're hypercarbic and they've got basically um, CO2 narcosis. That's why they're getting into it. That's why they're getting um, CNS involvement, brain involvement. So the heart leads to brain. That's how we go through it. So we ask which came first. We try to determine if one of those critical complaints is causing the others, or maybe they're separate pathologies. Maybe they've had a chest infection, so they've got an infectious disease problem, they've got a respiratory problem, and just to add insult to injury, now they're having a heart attack, and they're unrelated. Maybe they're related, doesn't matter. Uh, they've got multiple critical complaints. You've got a very sick patient. So that's, when I say they've got a very sick patient, that's what comes up next. Once we've gone through our critical complaints, one of the advantages of having the critical complaint is that it triggers you to think, how sick is this patient? And in medicine, we tend to use like different terminology that are 
confusing and inact, in, in, inaccurate, they're imprecise. They're, you know, symptomatic versus non-symptomatic, acute versus non-acute, stable versus unstable. I don't like those terms. They don't really give an immediate impression to me of what's going on with the patient. So what I teach my students to do is to uh, stratify acuity by not sick, sick, very sick, or dead. So let's talk about those because this is an underappreciatedly difficult skill. I, I think you need to be a paramedic or nurse or doctor or respiratory therapist or whatever you are for a few years before you can walk into the presence of a patient and go, oh, they're sick, like immediately. It takes a while. And I, I certainly remember, and in all humility, uh, I you know strongly recall with some embarrassment working with my mentors when I was learning to be a paramedic and we walk in, you know, hey, how's it going? Sort of relaxed paramedic attitude. And suddenly I realize they're on red alert and they're, you know, loading and going. And I'm like, what happened? What did you see that I didn't see? And I've had some good talks going through that. And that's part of how I developed these critical complaints of, oh, so, you know, these are the things that you look for in order to give good care and secondarily not look stupid <laughs> with your experienced mentors or partners. So we've gone through our critical complaints. Let's talk about how sick they are. And we'll talk about the definition of uh, not sick, sick, very sick, or dead. And let's start with the easiest one, not sick. So if they've got good ABCs and, uh, you know, reasonable vital signs and no critical complaints, then they're not really sick. And they might still want to see us. So for example, Fred with a sore wrist, good vitals, no problems with his heart, lungs, brain, infectious diseases, or perfusion. Is Fred sick? No, not really. He's not terribly sick. Uh, does he need to go to the hospital still and get checked out? Eh, maybe he could go to his GP instead. But you know what? I'm not going to say, you know, th this is unimportant. I'm here to help. I'm happy to help you. But in, in my inside voice, I'm not going, oh my God, this is an emergency. Fred's probably fine. And that's good to know that he's probably fine. So let's start thinking about other areas of care that we can, that we can give to Fred. Because as a paramedic, I'm not going to do a whole lot for a, sick, a sore wrist. The other end of the spectrum is very easy as well, and that's dead. So if he doesn't have a pulse and he's not breathing, if your patient doesn't have a pulse and they're not breathing, then they're clinically dead. And we're going to start cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We're going to start uh, compressions. We're going to start ventilations and you know, rapidly consider defibrillation. So that's dead. Not sick, dead, very easy. So let's talk about the two slightly ambiguous ones, and that sick is the first one we'll talk about. What do, what do we mean when we say that somebody's sick? Well, first of all, they don't have any critical complaints, or they have chronic critical complaints. So for example, I might say to Fred, uh, your wrist is, seems sore, and he goes, yeah, it's yeah, my wrist really hurts. And I say, you look like you're a little short of breath too. Are you having trouble breathing? And Fred says, yeah, I got COPD and I'm, I'm normally short of breath and, you know, a little bit of stress now, I'm, I'm short of breath. And I say, are you worried about that? Is that something that's a problem for you right now? He goes, no, my breathing's fine. It's fine. It's my, it's my wrist that I'm worried about. I said, you know, you're sure as a paramedic, I'm a little worried here that you look short of breath. No, our breathing's fine. The wife says, no, that's normal for him. Okay, fine. So again, Fred's not terribly sick. Um, if I say, how long have you been breathing like this? <laughs> Seven or eight years? Okay, not too worried about it. I mean, I'll keep an eye on it. I don't like when people appear dyspneic, but it, when I get a history of I've been like this for seven or eight years, that's pretty reassuring to me. I'm going to go with sick, not very sick. So let's talk about very sick. Very sick, obviously, is if they have one or more new onset critical complaints. And that's something that makes me go, in my inside voice, internal voice, uh-oh, I've got to worry about this. I've got to be careful about that. So those are the five critical complaints. And that's how we use the critical complaints to stratify the acuity of our patient. So you can see an experienced paramedic will walk in and see somebody sitting on the chair, tripoding, and they look at you and they're a little anxious. This is not regular for them. Right away, that's a very sick patient. Or you walk in and say, how are you feeling? Oh, my chest, I feel like there's a, oh, they're very sick. I know that right away. Or how are you feeling, sir? Uh, 
Um, they're not looking at you. They're not tracking. They're confused. They're not responding appropriately to verbal. That's brain. They're very sick. And that's how an experienced paramedic walks in and goes, very sick. You, you can pick it up in seconds, often. Pick it up in seconds. And, and the students, they're going, what happened? Why are you guys? Why are you guys in red alert here? I don't see anything. They just look like they're a little short of breath. And the experienced paramedic is going, they're sick. So let's talk a little bit about how we apply this. I'm going to give you some cases. I got five or six cases just to give you an example of how this works. And this is an example too of my own unique sort of shorthand. So 35 year old male complaining of weakness. He denies confusion, no lightheadedness. He's eupnic. Eupnic, just in case you're not familiar with that term, means uh, breathing comfortably. So dyspnic means having difficulty breathing. Apnic means they're not breathing. Eupnic means they're breathing well, normally, comfortably. A favorite band of mine from the 80s was the eurythmics. It means good rhythm, technically. So eupnic means breathing comfortably. Chest is clear. When we auscultate, we don't hear any adventitia, so we say the chest is clear. Denies chest pain or discomfort, not anxious, no signs of recent infection, strong radial pulse, 132 over 98. Okay, so how are they doing? Well, they're complaining of a little bit of weakness, but there's no confusion, there's no lightheadedness. Uh, I would say that that's a reasonable complaint for calling a paramedic, uh, but there's no real critical complaints there. Brain seems to be okay. Breathing, eupnic chest clear is okay. Heart seems to be okay. No chest pain or discomfort. There's no signs of infection, so I'm not thinking infectious disease. I've got a good radial pulse with a pressure that's reasonable. That's good perfusion. There's no critical complaints here. So I'm going to go with they're sick. They're not very sick, but they're sick. Let's get them to the hospital. Let's see what's going on. Or uh, let's investigate a little bit more and see if there's an alternate pathway that might be more appropriate. We're going to take this seriously, but I'm not on red alert. Okay, next one. 23-year-old female complaining of acute asthma exacerbation. So she's got a history of asthma, and now she's having an asthma attack. Very labored breathing, dyspneic, dizzy when she stands, nice chest pain, not recently ill, strong radial, good blood pressure. So acute asthma exacerbation with dyspnea, very labored breathing, and dizzy when she stands. That gives me lungs as a problem. That gives me brain as a problem. I'm not worried about the heart. I'm not worried about infectious disease. I'm not worried about perfusion right now. Although with an asthmatic, obviously, you have to be careful with the cardiac compression. But right now, with a pressure like that, that's pretty good. And if she's dizzy when she stands, that's not because of her perfusion. She's got a good blood pressure. So I'm thinking she's a, maybe a little hypoxic, maybe a little hypercarbic. Uh, either way... She's got brain, she's got lungs, that's very sick. And I'm going to go into, you know, high alert with this patient and start thinking about possible ways they can decompensate and even more importantly, possible ways that I can avoid that happening. So I'm going to start with my salbutamol and my epitropium bromide and all my other, I'm going to start going down my respiratory, then more focused asthma pathway and start to be concerned about that. Here's an easy one just to, you know, lighten the mood. Partner arrives at work and says, boy, I feel great. Obviously, not sick. No actual complaints at all. Easy. I could throw in another one here, but I thought it'd be a little bit obvious. You show up, patient has no pulse, they're not breathing. What are they? They're dead. All right. Next one. 65-year-old male complaining of a sudden onset of 8 out of 10 chest pain radiating to the jaw, no shortness of breath. Not dizzy, not confused. Currently 130 over 70, respiratory rate of 20, fine by basal and respiratory crackles, no recent illness. So let's go through this. 8 out of 10 chest pain. Heart, not good. Not dizzy or confused. Brain seems okay right now. 130 over 70, perfusion seems okay right now. Respiratory rate of 20 with fine by basal and respiratory crackles. Lungs are not okay. No recent illnesses. I'm not worried about infectious diseases. So we've got heart and we've got brain. Very sick. 47 year old male complaining of fatigue, recently ill with productive cough, lethargic, slight confusion, is not oriented to time, doesn't know what time it is when you ask him. 98 over 63 with a weak radial, respiratory rate of 18, no adventitia. Interesting patient. Um, so, 
complaining of fatigue, recently ill with productive cough. So we've got infectious diseases. Slight confusion, we've got some brain involvement. 98 over 63 with a weak radial, we've got perfusion problem. Now the lungs don't look too bad, but they're tachypneic. They're breathing fast with a respiratory rate of 18. I'm going to start to worry about this patient. They've got a few of the critical signs. They're also incidentally meeting the QSOFA criteria. Uh, if you're not familiar with QSOFA, it's the Quick Systemic Organ Systematic Organ Failure Assessment. I think it is. Um, and we look for three criteria. We look for a respiratory rate of more than 22, GCS of less than 15, or systolic less than 100. Two or more of those suggests sepsis. So this patient, who you might think, eh, they don't look so bad, you know, they got a bit of a productive cough when they're tired. I'm tired when I'm sick. A um, little bit confused, eh, it's not so bad. 98 over 63, is that so bad? Breathing a bit fast? Oh, they're sick. You could be lulled into a sense of complacency with this patient. But the, the fact that they're sick, they've got an infectious disease, should spark you to think, uh-oh, I've got to investigate that. And the investigation we'd use for this is the QSOFA score, and they actually have two or more, so this is a very sick patient. And you might miss this one. So that's, that's how this works as a bit of a safety net for your diagnostic pathways to make sure that you're looking for those subtle signs. And I find when I do scenarios with, uh, pati with patients, I keep getting the two mixed up. I've got two careers and I keep interchanging them uh, with students that sepsis is deceptive for them. Students often miss sepsis. And that's why I specifically put infectious diseases in there with um, the five critical complaints. If they've got any sort of infectious process going on, investigate that more and make sure this is not a patient in sepsis. Again, QSOFA criteria. 23-year-old male complaining of sudden onset of palpitations, but denies any chest pain, denies actually any real chest discomfort at all. There's no pressure. There's just, a, you know, palpitations. He describes it as butterflies in his chest. And you think, okay, that's not so bad. Eupnic, no adventitia. Good. Alert and oriented times three. Happy with that. 132 over 88. That's all good. Um, have I said no recent illness? Say there's no recent illness, but... Oh dear, when we take a radial pulse, which is strong and present, it's really fast. So we put them on a monitor and they show that they're in VT. Interesting question. Interesting case presentation. Because this person isn't really giving us any critical complaints right now. They're denying chest pain or discomfort. Maybe a bit of palpitations, but that's it. Brain seems okay, heart seems okay, at least in terms of their presentation to us. There's no infectious disease, respiratory is okay, uh, perfusion's okay, that's a great pressure. And I recognize that you could go either way. So they're not not sick and they're not dead. So we're, we're, we're straddling sick or very sick. And when we see, you know, conscious patient in VTAC at 280, we go, oh man, but it's really important to use the critical signs here because when we ask how sick are they, we're, we're recognizing the, the acuity of being in VTAC, especially a young guy, 23 years old. What's going on with this guy's heart? But we need to ask ourselves, how well are they compensating for the VTAC? And at the moment, this patient's actually compensating for it fairly well. So I would say, and I recognize people might go, oh, no way. But I, I will say that this is actually a sick patient so far. They're not very sick yet. And let me give you an example of why this becomes clinically important. When you start working at the, um, you know, uh, paramedic level, so in the United States, NREMTP. If you're working in Canada as an ACP, or if you're working in Australia as a CCP, ICP, MICA, when you're working at the next level paramedic, you're, you're faced with a, a therapeutic dilemma here of what do I do? Do I go with ventricular antidysrhythmics as a drug, or do I use synchronized cardioversion on this patient? And because they're tolerating this well, because they don't have critical complaints right now, and because their vitals are actually pretty good, 
I would say, based on that, I'm going to go with the ventricular antidysrhythmic. So something like amiodarone or lidocaine is a bit old school. That's where I came from. Um, I would use a ventricular antidysrhythmic to treat this patient. If, on the other hand, they were confused, they were complaining of crushing chest pain, they had a weaker absent radial, then, okay, forget about it. I'm going directly to synchronized cardioversion, like giver. This, this patient needs uh, immediate intervention because they are very sick. Not sick, they're very sick. Okay, that's how we would use this. So in summary, we're going to use our primary survey, secondary survey. In the secondary survey, we're going to ask the patient to report their own chief complaint in their own words. Once they've given us their chief complaint, regardless of what it is, whether it's a non-critical complaint or a critical complaint, I'm going to inquire about all of the critical complaints that haven't been spontaneously offered so I can rule them out. If I have more than one critical complaint spontaneously offered or discovered, then I'm going to try and figure out which is the first domino, which one is causing the others. And then I'm going to quickly in my head categorize them, stratify them into not sick, sick, very sick, or did. Very useful tool, and it helps, it helps catch you uh, when you're doing these scenarios so that you don't let critical patients slip through your fingers. I find that the students who do these in scenarios, boy, it's just, it's so hard to catch them, you know? Part of our job as uh, uh, educators is to try and throw you scenarios that are going to catch you up because we want you to make your mistakes in the lab not in the field so we we get you know sneaky and we throw sneaky patients at you with occult sepsis that you don't recognize right away um, and when i throw those types of scenarios at patients who have a good solid or patients students who have a good solid grasp of the critical complaints really, really hard to catch them. People who are systematic, go through the, the critical complaints carefully, get the full set of vital signs, and then reassess the critical complaints and vital signs and ABCs. Every time there's a change in the patient, they do really, really well. So word to the wise, understand, live it, learn it, love it, understand the critical complaints, or understand how to use them understand that stratification of not sick, sick, very sick, or dead, and you'll do well in scenarios, and you'll do well in the field, more importantly. All right, if you've got any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below uh, or contact me directly, and I'm happy to respond. Thanks for listening.